God wants to bring some restoring. And we think of that, we, we think out there, we look across the street, the bar, this and that. You know, it's very easy in our society to live a life of complete deflection. We talk about the government, this is crooked, that's crooked, this is messed up. What about you? The government is stealing, are you tithing? Are you robbing God? The government does this, the government, what about you? It's very easy to look outside and go, the world is messed up. God wants to address the heart. This is beyond money. I'm not talking about money. It has nothing to do with that, but I'm talking about God wants to bring restoration to our soul. Now, here's what happens. When you sin, sin is not iniquity. Sin is missing the mark. Iniquity is choosing to miss the mark on purpose. You have to get in, in you why you want to make that choice or else you'll never get free from that pattern or from that habit or from those ideas. So that's one thing. So that's on purpose. I like it. I want to keep doing it. Sin is I missed the mark. I don't really feel good about missing the mark. I didn't really want to miss the mark, but I just simply missed the mark. What, what happens with sin is sin leads to all types of brokenness in our soul, in our relationships, it manifests physically, economically, relationally, in many different ways. But, and so when you choose to follow the Lord, He restores your soul like in Psalm 23. And He does it according to the paths of righteousness. So it's like an active recovery. Like when you first get injured, you have to like rest your injury, ice it, heat it, depending on you, whoever tells you what to do. There's like a time of rest where like you really need to like not do anything. And then to really recover, there's something called active recovery that is a necessary part to get blood flow back to the area that was injured because there's healing in the blood. There's a message there. But we're, we're not uh, going into all that. But what God wants to do today is you're going to see that there's going to be a restoration between Joseph and his brothers, which is really important. But what God wants to do with us is not only restore our relationships, and, and you know, it could be a marriage. It, it could be health. One, one of the things that I feel God wants to do today with someone is that there's someone who suffers migraines very badly, and it affects the left side of their face. I don't know who's the left side. But there's the, the Lord wants, to, and I'm talking about like right behind the forehead, like very bad. The Lord wants to heal you today. So I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. We're happy to pray for you. But I'm telling you, these are very bad pains. And, and the Lord wants to lift that off of you. Many times that is, that is a manifestation of worry and anxiety. Not always, but many times. So anyway, that was a side note. So God wants to bring restoration. And we can, in our life, we can either partner with Him or work against Him. And that choice is ours. He will not make it for you. He will support you in your choice. <laughs> what do I mean by that? It's like, well, He will either let you become willing because you are smart, or He will have a fish swallow you and spit you out somewhere else that worship fish so that those people have to listen to you even though you don't want them to listen to you. <laughs> you know, Jonah did not want Nineveh to listen to him. And God goes, oh, you want to resist me? I won't choose Amos. Amos is too good. He's a good guy. I'll choose Jonah. He's prejudiced. He's a prophet. He's crazy. He wants this city to be judged. And this city, Nineveh, they worship Dagon, the fish god. So they're going to listen to you even though you don't want them to listen to you. God is God. Let me say one thing about God. God works all things after the counsel of his own will, which means that God counsels himself and does what he wants. And he's able, when you don't do what he wants, to take that and do something beautiful from that. Like he's able to take the jealousy and the insecurity and the partiality of Jacob and the jealousy of his brothers. And he's able to send a man into Egypt to go through a process to become the type of person that can save the world. But before you save the world, you have to get some things in yourself 
resolved. Many times we live with unresolved stuff on the inside. Now here's, 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 here's what I will say. If you have unresolved things in your life, in your own heart, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about the person that hurt you. I'm talking about you. You will have a trail relationally of unresolved things. Because, for example, the Bible says, live peaceably with all men such as you are able. If a man does not have peace with himself, he cannot live at peace with you. So that's why it says, as you are able. There's some people, they don't have peace, they don't want peace, and so you have to peacefully say, <laughs> like, peace, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. And, and that's okay, that's okay. So anyway, let me, let me give you just a, a brief catch up, and I, and I don't want today to be a full hostage, I want it to be like a half hostage. Some of the people want to rename this hostage church. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, and, and the logo would be, you know, duct tape on a chair. <laughs> There's a gallon of water in a rag. <laughs> it's for waterboarding, enhanced interrogation. So I'm just joking. So anyway. <laughs> so Joseph is the favorite son. He's got the coat of many colors because favor always materializes into something. It does. Uh, and so he's got this coat. The coat drives his brothers crazy. And his bad report about them drives him crazy. So he really lacked emotional intelligence, spiritual maturity. He really lacked self-awareness, which most Christians don't have much of that. And so he really lacked that. He had zeal. He's a believer. He was crazy. He believed. But he didn't really have wisdom. And that's okay, because if you have zeal and you don't have wisdom, you're going to get yourself into a situation where you'll grow in wisdom. God is like, no problem. I work out all things after the counsel of my own will and I can take things that are not my will that you have done and enter into this process with you and work something beautiful through something broken. It's called the great exchange of beauty for ashes. It's at the very center of the gospel and God is good and he's working all things out for the good of those who love him and accord according to his purpose, not their purpose. We have an obsession with our purpose, our purpose, my purpose, my purpose, my purpose, but it's actually his purpose that you need to get a hold of. So that's that's a whole nother thing. But we'll we'll. So then they send him in to slavery. Remember, he, he's he's in it. They wanted to kill him, and then one guy, Reuben's like, no, let's like get rid of him. They sell him, and uh, so anyway, he his brothers. He's in a pit. He gets this prophetic word. The sun, the moon, and the stars are going to bow down to you, representing his father, his mother, and his 11 brothers. They didn't like this prophetic word at all. Um, and so the very next scene is he's in a ditch looking up at them. He must have been thinking, God, like, the word that you gave me, it's like the very opposite happened. It's like, you know, people say, the church is going to grow. People leave, More people leave. It's like, what in the world? Like, And sometimes... That's all preparation for growth because there's people that don't want to grow and are not going to grow with you and they got to leave. There's some people that will literally obstruct movement and God will move them on. One of the things is when God moves people on from your life, thank Him. Thank Him. I don't get too attached emotionally. If God moves you, that's all right. <laughs> because you know something? I want to move with God. If you want to obstruct that, you don't have that permission. Even when I first met my wife, she can, she'll tell you, I said, I'm going to follow Jesus my whole life. If there's ever a conflict of interest, this is not going to work. Did I say that? Yeah. So, so I'm just saying that, that you, have to, you have to decide what you're going to let obstruct you and who you're going to let obstruct you. Because I'm telling you that nobody's worth it. You're going to stand before Jesus. <laughs> so anyway, they say, so he goes in. Now he's in a pit. He gets he, he, the Ishmaelites and then the Midianites. and So he winds up where? Potiphar's house. He's doing good. He's learning stewardship. Stewardship is essential because he's going to steward the resources of Egypt. So you always learn. Uh, you learn in a lower level. You don't learn up top. That's why when I say we're not ready, I'm serious. I'm not joking. 
I'm not, I don't say that to be jerky. I say that to be honest. Because if I say that we're ready and we're not ready, that's destructive. That's like my coach saying, yeah, man, you got 500 and then it pancakes on me. I hurt the handlers and I look like an idiot and my pictures are no good. Because someone told me, you're ready, bro. You're ready. That's all you, bro. All you. No, it's not all, you know, that's not, we're not. So just, and also, can I say something to you? Sometimes we have to be thankful that God didn't give us what we asked for. Because sometimes, man, that, that can really hurt us. So anyway, he learned stewardship in Potiphar's house and he learns self-control that's a part Oof. self-control is a part of stewardship the most powerful thing that you can say is no he said no to Potiphar's wife and the reward was, the reward of faithfulness was a prison. Being falsely accused. And you know who looks crazy? Potiphar. Poor Potiphar. Poor Potiphar. That guy has to live with that woman. That's sad. There's a lot of Potiphar's that are suckers. They got to live with, I mean, that's really, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I got to be careful. I start going crazy here. I mean, this is not. You get to duct tape. So Potiphar, poor Potiphar, got to pretend. You got to take pictures at the Apple Farm while she's messing around on him. Kiki will have you paying child support on a kid that's not even yours. Listen to me. If you don't, you you have to learn to say no. You know who you should have said no to? Her. That's another whole message. Some people don't even know what the heck they're living with. Anyway, let's get out of here. I got I to gotta get out of Jerry Springer here and I got to get back into the Bible because I, I don't like to see, I don't like to see, can I tell you something? I don't like to see people that I love and care about get messed with by the devil or by, or by stuff. I don't like that. You know, my son doesn't like that. My little guy, there was a kid on his team being picked on. Immediately, immediately he shut it down. He said, leave him alone. Don't do that. Immediately, he shut it down. And I respect that. I, I, don't, I don't like to see the devil mess with people and exploit God's people. I hate that. So anyway, he says no, and he gets, this is the reward for being faithful, prison. You know, sometimes that happens to you. You make a, you make a wise decision, a faithful decision, and the, re, the, the, the result of that is limitation. You make a, a bad decision and you have freedom. You make a wise decision and all of a sudden now you have limitation. Now, he goes to prison. What does he learn in prison? One, how to dif deal with difficult people. Two, how to interpret dreams. Three, how not to self-promote. That's a part of self-control. Self-promoting is, is the antithesis of self-control. You are not ready for a promotion if you're selling yourself. Let God promote you. Get yourself in the secret place. Become glued to the floor until God has to raise you up. Don't, don't seek all that. That'll hurt you. That, that will not. So anyway, he gives a prophecy, he interprets it, and, and he has to, he's like, hey, remember me, 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 me. What did that get him? Two more years in the slammer. Two more years of learning to wait. He gets called up to Pharaoh. As soon as he, before he even addresses Pharaoh, he goes, this, this interpretation, this is God. <laughs> this is not me. That's what two years in limitation is supposed to teach you. Not you. God. Some people get more than two years. I think I got like 10 or 12. That's all right. Maybe we're stupid. Two years. For Joseph, maybe he learned quicker in prison. I don't know. Two years, he, he, then he gets it. He's not the, when he comes out of that place, he is never the same man. You have to remember that. 
When he comes out of there, he's not the same. Limitation is supposed to absolutely destroy you. And yet we reach for more options and more stuff. And God is like, no, no, no. You're not processed. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not you know, no, 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 no. The signature is not on this vessel yet. This vessel still has time in the oven and on the shelf. That's a whole potter's message. That's a whole nother. I got to get out of here. I need help. I need someone to reel me in. <laughs> Sarah's here. So, so anyway, so now Pharaoh has a crisis. Pharaoh has a problem. He's got resources, but no wisdom. He's got resources, but no revelation. And he's really troubled. God is a troubler of kings. A defender of, a widow, of the widows, but a troubler of kings. And so anyway, Pharaoh now is, is looking for wisdom in Egypt, but guess what? There's no wisdom in Egypt. There's no wisdom on CNN. There's no wisdom on Fox. There's no wisdom. They just talk and talk and talk and have nothing to say. Preach. Nothing. Mumble and talk. And talk about themselves and how great they are and what I did. You got one person that talks about how great he is and he's the all he, everything he him and the other one he can't he's mumbling. Blah, blah, blah. This is the best we have to offer. Do you see that we have an ex existential crisis in our nation? Do you see him falling all over our president? That's like our nation. That's a sign. We better wake up. And listen, the church, if you're a church person, you got to wake up. You, you got to come out of the fog of busyness and, 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 and you got you to gotta see things for, because we're living in times that could become severe. You, ha you have to really ask God. So anyway, Pharaoh has a crisis, so he reaches out to Egypt, calls Egypt, no solution to Egypt, and then the baker remembers, oh, there's a guy, Joseph. Joseph comes out like, oh no, it's not me, it's God. You know, he comes out humble pie. He goes from humble pie... And then he has to actually tell Pharaoh. And, and just because someone has humility doesn't mean they don't have authority. You, if you're going to have authority that is from the Spirit of God, you have to have humility. Because the authority is not you, it's him. That's what Joseph learned in the two years. So he interprets a dream. He tells him the next 14 years... God, the Holy Spirit, loves to reveal things to come. That's what Jesus said about Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wants to show us things to come. We are so stuck in the past and so infatuated with now and so afraid of tomorrow that we cannot see the desire tomorrow and the design for tomorrow. God wants to show us things to come. Do you, do you, do you know the story of, of the guy, I don't know his name, maybe Brett knows his name, of the guy in 2008 who bet against the banks? The movie The Big Short. I know you don't watch movies like that or whatever. But this was, this. what's the point? The point is, there was someone who analyzed the numbers and saw what was happening. What was happening? I'm going to give you Reader's Digest. The federal government put pressure on the banks to give loans to people who could not afford them. I know because I have family members that lost their house. Listen to me. The federal government put pressure. I don't even know why I'm doing this here. The federal government. I, sometimes I want to just eject myself from my own body. The federal government. The federal government puts pressure on the banks to give loans to people that created a housing crisis. There was, I think, six million people that lost their houses or something like that. There was someone who saw it before it happened. Someone was paying attention. There's always someone who's looking. 
Let it be us. Let it be us. Let it be the people of God who have eyes to see. Come on. I don't know about you, but I want eyes to see. He bet against the most powerful institutions, and I'm not for betting, I'm against that, but he, he invested because he knew what he saw. Everyone stood against him. You have to have the power to stand alone when you know what God said or what God showed you. You have to have strength to stand. Everyone told him, you're crazy, you're going to da 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 He was right. He had eyes to see. This is important. If we don't have eyes, we're not seeing. Joseph, this is supposed to be the people of God. This is supposed to be our inheritance. We're supposed to be the ones that see. Not looking to the government so to, to, give them, to give us something. Are you? This is crazy. Anyway. We're the ones who are supposed to have eyes to see. So Joseph is the one who has eyes to see. He's like, let me tell you about the next 14 years. This is supposed to be us, the people of God. We're supposed to be the voice of God in the earth. When you walk in, the voice of God is walking in, hopefully. Instead, sometimes that's not really what's happening. But that's the heart of God. That his sons and daughters would be the voice of the Father in the earth. In, in a generation of people who are orphaned, who lack identity, who do not know who they are, they need the voice of the Father in the earth. More than ever before, we need the voice of the Father. The voice of a Father is really something when it's right. Some of you did not have that, so you don't know about that. But this is really something that God wants to do in you. Maybe you didn't have that, but that doesn't mean you can't become that. You can stand up and you can break the curse and you can live differently. So anyway, now Joseph is about to be reconciled to his brothers. And guess what moves the story forward again? A crisis. Now if you look at your life, I can look at my life and tell you that crises <laughs> have been a place where I have encountered Christ deeply and intimately and in reality. And they have been used in my life, although God did not send it, God has used it to bring my life in Him forward. Now, I don't sit where I ultimately want to be in life. I'm not saying I've arrived anywhere. But I have, every time there's been a crisis, if you respond to the Lord correctly in a crisis, God brings you forward. Whatever that means, wherever you are, maybe you're here and you're there or you're here and now you're here. But no matter where you find yourself, if you will respond to Jesus correctly in a crisis, you will move forward. Which is to me is really good news because God will use something that the enemy is trying to use to stop you, to silence you and to set you back. And God will say, cool, I got that. I work all things after the counsel of my own will. And although I did not do that, I will use that to spring you forward. To me, that's cra that is crazy. That shows you the sovereignty of God overall. Although he does not control every other thing, he is in charge. And if he goes, listen, man, I'm going to spit you out of a whale and I'm going to send you to a city to a preach to a people that you don't even want to listen to you and they're going to listen to you. I mean, God is God. And, and I think that sometimes in America we get this little nice democracy God who we vote on and the board votes on God and how long God has in the service and what God can do and how, how God can move and, and we will schedule God. Maybe I'll have time for God this week. But the God of the Bible cannot be contained. He's a breakout God. He breaks out. He'll spit you out of a wheel, knock you off a horse. I mean, he'll just suck you up into heaven. He'll just do, I mean, he just, he's God. Just so you know. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like we lose that, like, like who are we talking to and who are we talking about? Anyway, now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? <laughs> you ever have a problem and everyone's just sitting there looking at each other? He's like, boys, <laughs> looking at each other is not going to solve it. In a crisis, you don't stand there and stare at each other, you move. Have you ever been in a real crisis? You know that. 
Okay. Why do you look at one another? He said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to the place and buy it for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain, but Joseph did not send, uh, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. L l now, you know where the land of Canaan is? Canaan is promised land. The promised land is being affected by the famine. You know what that means? They're not ready for the promise. They're not ready. They're going to have to leave the promised land so that they can die to the promise so that they can inherit the, unpromised, the promised land. If you do not die to the promise, you cannot steward the promise. God, when he said to Abraham, give me Isaac, God was not trying to kill Isaac, God was trying to kill Abraham. If you're not a dead man, you cannot steward the promises of God. If it's still about you and your will and what you want and I did this and I did that and I want to do that, that's not, you're not ready. You have to be completely dead. Crucified. I mean really good and dead. God says in the New Testament, He wants you dead so bad, He doesn't want to just kill you and crucify you. He wants to bury you. He wants to make sure this is real, real good, and <laughs> good, and <laughs> good and done. Because I, I am of no use to God doing things in my own strength in my own way. God doesn't need another slick idea from a kid from New Jersey. He doesn't need that. What he needs is a yielded ear and a willing heart and someone who's willing to say, yes, God, I'm willing to move with you. So now there's a crisis in the promised land. So now this is really difficult. And, and I don't know if you, if you realize this, but God has not spoken to Jacob for about 22 years. God has not, he has not had a God encounter for a long time because he has been living under the delusion that his son is dead because he trusted the wrong people. He trusted his sons. His sons did not even respect him enough to tell him the truth. There could be people in your own house who are not with you. That's a whole nother thing. They, they don't even respect their father enough to tell him the truth. That's why they're going to go into bondage. Dishonor always leads to bondage. That's another. They sold their brother as a slave. Their sons are going to become slaves. Listen, you're going to, you think that you, you will get what you, what you sow, you will reap. They don't know it yet. But it's all good because God is saying, oh, I, I swore to Abraham, my friend, that these people are going for 400 years to Egypt and under another country in a place of oppression, I'm going to make them a mighty nation. Now, can I tell you, this is not how I would build a nation. I get a little island. I bring only normal people who are, you know, functional. And I, you know, you have, you have to be very vetted to come. You can't, that's how I would, I would like, God says, no, I'll send them into slavery and I'll make a mighty people out of them. It's like, wow, wow God, that sounds like a crazy idea. And, and, but that's what he did. They're moving toward the promise that God said to Abraham that they will inherit this land, but this land cannot be fruitful because they are not fruitful. They're gonna, God is going to deal with them. Okay, now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold up, and it was he who sold all to all the people of the land. So now Joseph is the governor, and Joseph is the grain salesman. <laughs> Look at God. <laughs> you think God doesn't have a sense of humor? You think that Jesus 
doesn't have a sense of humor, you think that God has, doesn't have the most amazing personality out of anyone you've ever met in your life, you don't know Him. If you think of God like He's stale and angry and on meds, you don't know God. God is full of joy. Do you know that God is happy with Himself? <laughs> he is. God enjoys fellowshipping with himself. He's in agreement with himself. He's very secure. Jesus said, greater works for you do, you're not greater than me. He is very secure. Isn't that something? So now I can just see God smiling. <laughs> they're going, <laughs> they're hungry, <laughs> they're all in chaos, hungry, and, you know, upset. And uh, they're going to buy grain in Egypt, which is really disrespectful to them, you know, totally. And uh, God is like, guess who's the, who's the bread man? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought of this. Like, they're going, Joseph saves the life of the people who sold him out. How's that for blessed are the merciful? How's that for kingdom of God way of doing things? How's that for a way of conquering, not through a sword, but through serving, through mercy? How's that for mercy triumphs over judgment? Look at that. This is, this is the hand of God. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with all their faces to the earth. Now, it's not all 11, so they're going to bow a second time because once is not enough. Jacob is like, listen, send these other 10 guys out. But Benjamin, no, no, he's going to stay with me. Because I was Rachel's son. So he's like, I can lose these 10. <laughs> God bless them. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> but I cannot lose this one. I cannot lose Benjamin. Interesting. This is, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying this is what happened. <laughs> it's like, so, so he's like, I'm not. So they go. They bow before Joseph. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. Listen. He could see them. They couldn't see him. That's a message. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? So now he starts, he starts grilling them. He starts. He knew, but he wasn't ready. Watch. Then Joseph remembered the dream. Which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to the land to see the nakedness of the land. Let me just say one thing to you. If Joseph wanted to seek vengeance or have revenge on them, immediately when he recognized them, he could have took vengeance on them. But what ha what's happening is Joseph is, is processing a situation in real time. Have you ever seen someone who becomes socially awkward? Maybe because they're not emotionally aware of what's going on in them. So they don't know how they're going to act. And so he's processing this in real time. He hasn't seen them for a very long time. You have to have some compassion for him. Imagine seeing the people, your half-brothers who sold you into slavery, and then seeing all that God did and where you are right now, and they're coming to you because they have a need and you don't. It's very powerful when God is the one who meets your needs because then you're free to do what God called you to do, not to have to dance around. You know who has to dance around? They do, not him. You're very vulnerable. When your needs are not met, you're very vulnerable. Then Joseph remembered the dream. Okay, 10. And they said, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's son. We are honest. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no. But you have come to see the nakedness of the land. 
And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. The one that is no more, they are talking to him. People will discredit you and act like you don't exist when you're right in front of them. And you still have to love them and minister to them. <laughs> they, they cannot see him, but he can see them. Remember that. You have to be able to, if you're going to minister to people, you have to be able to see them. You cannot minister to what you cannot see. Okay. Now, but Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, you are spies. In this manner, you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You should not leave this place unless your younger brother comes up here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison, and your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in a prison three days. So Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. So Joseph was not, he, now he, he did not, at this moment, he has three days where it does, he doesn't fully know what he's going to do. And I, I, I want to just show you this in, in, just, in, a, in your life. You do not have to respond to something immediately. You don't have to force something. If you really don't know what you're going to do or what you should do, wait. You will not regret waiting. You will regret saying stuff that you didn't think through more thoroughly. Doing things that you were not informed about. You, you, doing things out of anger. Doing things out of feeling the sense of pressure. One of the, one of the things that I learned from an old man of God in, in Brooklyn, New York one time is that he said this to me. I never forget it. He said, Adam, the devil pushes. God leads. Do not be pushed into something. Do not allow yourself to be pushed into anything. He, so he takes three days. And since he fears God... He is not going to seek vengeance. He's not going to abuse them. And he's not going to abuse his authority. Listen to me. If you live in unforgiveness, you will probably abuse authority. What do I mean by that? I mean if you have unforgiveness in your life, if you have unresolved issues in your life, there's a very high probability that you will abuse or misuse authority. That's very important. Okay. Okay. So Joseph said, I fear God, do this and live, for I fear God, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine for your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul. 20 years ago, 22 years ago, is rushing to them right now. You see the level of unresolved conflict? Unconfessed sin and unresolved conflict. Unconfessed sin leaves people with unresolved conflict. When I confess my sin to God, I'm forgiven. When I confess it to someone, the shame is lifted. Many people cannot get free of shame because they have not confessed it to someone, so it, they're hiding stuff. And as long as you're hiding, you cannot live in transparency, vulnerability, boldness. You'll always be with shame. That's why getting offloading to the right person in the right circumstances is one of the things that removes shame. So anyway... His soul was in anguish when, we, when he pleaded with us and we, and, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. So, so they are thinking that this situation... And guess what? They're right. Do you know many times you intuitively know why you're in a situation but you refuse to change it? I've been there. So that's how I can say that with confidence. <laughs> Okay, we'll keep on moving. And Reuben answered them saying, Did I not speak to you saying, Do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Now, now Reuben here is, he is self-aggrandizing and he's retelling the story in a really twisted way. 
He's the guy that sold one ounce of weed and made you think he used to be a huge coke dealer. He's, he's self-aggrandizing the past and making more of his stand against them, which was not actually that accurate. It's interesting how we don't remember things correctly. When you have unresolved conflict, it messes up your memory. When I was young, I lied about one story so much that when I got older, I, for, I didn't know if I would lie about that if it really happened. And I had to ask God to forgive me because I said I lied so much, I don't even remember, honest to God, what, I, what happened. <laughs> so anyway, lies hurt you. Okay, Reuben answered and said this, okay, and you would not listen, therefore behold, his blood is now required of us. So now they thought he was dead, they thought he was gone too. They, 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 and so now... What they're talking about is the doctrine of blood guilt, which actually has not even came forth in the Bible yet, but they intuitively knew it. The Bible talks about the only way to cleanse the land of the shedding of innocent blood is by the blood of those who shed it, in Leviticus. It's the doctrine of blood guilt. The, the blood of aborted babies cries out to God against our nation. If we ever got what we deserved, it would look like Somalia. If, we ever got what we, if, if America ever got what it deserved, you wouldn't need to go to Haiti. You'd be right here. It, 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 we, if we ever got what we've sown, the type of destruction that we've sown. I'm sorry to tell you that. I know that, you know, it's hard for people to hear that, but anyway. All right, let's move on. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. Now, Joseph is a ruler now. He has emotional intelligence. He is not throwing out all his cards on the table. He is gathering data so that he can make an informed decision. Let me just tell you something. Do not throw all your cards on the table. I don't do that. When I know something about someone, I ask around. I ask a little to see if they're willing to be honest with me. If they're not willing to be honest with me, I don't get involved. I don't, I don't, emotionally, I don't get involved because if you're not going to be forthright with me, I'm going to do a little reconnaissance first. If you're not going to be forthright with me, I, it's a waste of my time. They're talking. They don't even know that Joseph knows what's going on. He's got to read on the whole situation. They don't. Anyway, and he turned himself away from them and wept. So what he does is, now he, he moves away from them. He does not, again, throw all his cards on the table. So sometimes you have to have self-control to not throw out all your cards on the table. This is, this is like, this is, he's really like teaching us something here. Okay, then he returned to them and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound them, uh, bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. Thus he did for them. This is the guy that he's giving them provisions for their journey when he was sitting in a pit and they were eating a meal in front of him and not even caring about him. He, this is, he is, they sent him in to bondage, to be a slave, and look at what he's doing. He's saying, guys, make sure you have food for the road. And he fills their sacks with grain. That means that he resolved the conflict within himself. How do we know he resolved the conflict? The way he responded. How do we know it's not resolved? The way you respond. That's it. It's very clear. You, you know that, that that type of response is very evident that, the, the, that this situation... Do you see 22 years later, they are 20 or 22 years later, I think it's 22, they are literally dealing with something that they never dealt with and they never confessed. Now they're confessing in front of a stranger that's their brother and they don't know it's him and he knows it's them and they don't know that he knows what they're saying, but he knows. I mean, just think of that, how he looks. I mean, he, he, does it, he looks like 
He, he is in, listen, he is in a position of power over them and he uses that position over them to serve them. That's how we use power in the kingdom. We don't flex on people. We don't manipulate people. We don't use it against them. We show love and we show mercy and we show generosity. That's power. Joseph is a powerful man. And that is how we use power. And the thing is that if you don't get the, the issues in your life resolved, you cannot be entrusted with power or resources. So you, you have to get, there's things that you have to ask yourself and you have to ask the Lord, why did I do this? Why? Why did I do that? And let the Lord bring truth to you so that you can have resolution so that you can move forward and so that he can trust you. All right. Now, so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened the sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money and there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored and there it is, my sack. Then their hearts failed them and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? Now they're blaming God. They, these guys, listen, when you have unresolved conflict, you know what you have? Confusion. You have no clarity. You, you know who has clarity? Joseph has clarity. You know why Joseph has clarity? Not because he's better than them. Because he resolves his unforgiveness. How do we know? The way he treated them. Listen, if, if he didn't forgive them, he could have used the power that he had to get even with them. They could have disappeared and never been seen again. And you know what? Guess what? Who cares? He could have, I mean, nobody cares. You, you hit the dad already was like, I can't lose this guy. <laughs> you guys go buy food. Like, like he could have, he could have easily taken advantage of his power and he didn't. Real power is not what you do. It's what you don't do. That's real power. M most of the time where we see our power, we go, oh, I did this. I went here. I bought that. I live here. I drive that. Real power is what you say no to. Vengeance, greed, fear, lust, vengeance, uh, retribution. That's real power. So he sends them on their way and he gives them their money back. He's saying to them, I don't need your money. Then their hearts failed them. They're afraid. 29. Then they went to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, and told them all that had happened. They didn't tell them all that had happened. They never even told their father all that had happened. They said to their brother Joseph, we're honest men. They're lying to themselves. You're not honest people. You're standing in front of the guy that you sold and you can't even see him. You are so dishonest, you don't even have discernment. You're living with so much confusion that you don't even know. You, you're thinking God did something to you that you did to yourself. I mean, this is, this is when you have unresolved stuff, man, this really, I mean, it really fogs the... the, the <laughs> the windshield there <laughs> so anyway <laughs> all right we are honest men uh, we are not spies so he so he now they're telling their, they're telling their dad what they told him like we told them the truth you still haven't told your dad the truth I mean they, they are it comes to a point where you believe your own lies I mean it's sad I mean that that's that's what happens when we live with a level of unresolved conflict, we believe our own lies. We've lied to ourselves for so long that we believe. And you know, I'm convinced of something. And I hope I'm not going to say this in a jerky way. But I am convinced that Christians lie to themselves better than any other people. Because we use faith in the name of Jesus to lie to ourselves. Sarah's giving me the shot clock. Praise the Lord. All right. 
we are 12 brothers, our son. So they rehearsed the whole story to him. Now, I'm going to go to 35. I'm trying to do this for the sake of time. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks. And surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. See this? Me. It's all about me when I'm in pain. Me, me, me. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. He's saying two of his sons are dead that are both alive. He is so far from an encounter with God, he lacks so much discernment, he's, he is believing the wrong people. Do you know people who have a lack of discernment believe the wrong people? How do I know that? Remember what just happened with COVID? Do you know how adamant people were about believing the wrong people? I sat back and look, look, looked, and I go, very unimpressive. Believing the wrong people for a long time. Living under the influence of fear. Super unimpressive. Imagine how God feels. How easily my people are, are just little commercial, little TV, and my people are out to, out, to, out to pasture. Making choices based on fear that curse them. My people not trusting in me trusting in the government, and the government betrayed us. God, you, you, you listen to me. I'm not trying to be harsh. You, we, we've got to allow God to resolve the things in our life. We cannot play games with God. You cannot play games with your future or your family. You have to learn who to trust and who you should listen to. One of the most important things in your life you, have to, you ever can know is who to listen to. What voice to listen to? I mean, this, that's really... He's listening to people who don't even know what's going on in their own life. He's their father. He's supposed to be able to pick up on this. Then Reuben spoke to his father and said, Kill my two sons. <laughs> <laughs> no. If I do not bring him back to you, Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. Then he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. He has ten sons in front of him and he's saying he's alone. You ever feel alone in a crowd? I mean, that, that's, that's what he's... You know, you know what people would give for one son? He's got eleven. And, he, and he's, reading, he's, re, he's not reading the room right. That, that shows you how far he is from an encounter with God. The closer you are to an encounter with God, the better you can read the room. The better you can discern what is happening. But he said, my son shall not go down. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring me down to my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now the famine was severe. <laughs> <laughs> Watch. <laughs> Watch what happens when the when the pockets get hit. Because you know the pocket affects the belly. You, no money, no food. Or you have money and no food, that's a problem. Watch how the Lord uses this crisis to move the mission forward. And do you know that one of his sons is in prison the whole time and he doesn't do anything? That's a man who has lost hope. He doesn't even have, and this is a man who you're going to see later on. He, he was a man of war, battle. You know, he took stuff from the Amorites. Like, like this was not a guy that was, was a stranger to any sense of conflict. And he lost hope, so he lost his, his desire and his ability to fight for his own son. That's how, that's how sad he was. That's what happens when grief overtakes you. You lose the strength and the ability to fight. Now the famine was so severe in the land that it came to pass... And when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought down uh, from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. Then Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face uh, unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if, not, if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel 
said, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? It's all about him. That's what pain, pain sees everything through the lens of me. The little cracked windshield where everyone's against poor little me. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me, and we will arise and go. Then we will live and not die, both we and you also, our little ones. I myself will be surety for him, uh, for my hand, uh, you shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever, for if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. In other words, we, if we would have moved already, we would have already been back. I will be collateral. D -d 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 Judah. Do you know that the line of the tribe of Judah was collateral for us? God, Jesus said, my life for theirs. There's all types of gospel shadows in this whole thing, which I cannot get into all of them, but he was willing to put himself in harm's way to secure the future. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back uh, in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother and arise and go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Like whatever happens, happens type of situation. New Jersey, what it is what it is type of situation. That's really hopeless. When someone starts saying it is what it is, they have given up. <laughs> Whatever they're talking about, it's, it's over emotionally. Uh, so the men uh, took the present and Benjamin, and they had doubled the money in their hand, and the rose went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men. Will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered. And the man brought the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks for the first time that we are brought in so that we may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each, there each man's money was in the full mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, so we have brought it back in our hand. And we have brought it down with our money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. For your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. He did it under Joseph's command. He's trying to speak calm to them. So the man brought the men into, okay, gave them water and washed their feet and gave their donkeys feed. Then they made, uh, the present ready for Joseph coming at noon, for they feared that they would eat bread there. When Joseph came, they brought him the present which was in the hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth, all 11 of them. The dream is starting to be fulfilled. We've got to resolve stuff within ourselves before the dream can be fulfilled. All 11 of them. This is the beginning of it. Then he asked about their well-being. Look at this. He's concerned about their well-being. They sold him into slavery. He's concerned about their well-being. That's what it looks like to be a champ in the kingdom. You care about people that don't care about you. They're only there because they have a need. They don't care about you. <laughs> That's another message. Uh, we'll continue on. Now, 
Then they asked about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? They answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. This is round two. This is the third time they're bowing down to him. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God, be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept. Then he washed his face and came out. And he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. You have to learn how to restrain yourself. You have to learn how to restrain yourself sexually. And you have to learn how to restrain yourself emotionally. There are certain contexts where it is amazing to cry and to break down and to cry and to weep and to be hugged and loved. Church is a great place for that. Worship is a great place for that. that but there's, there's certain places where it's not really time for that. It's not really the place for that. So Joseph knows he, he, he moves himself and falls apart. But he had the power to restrain himself. That's very, very important. You cannot be a ruler if you don't have the power to restrain yourself. That is, that is really uh, very elementary. Now, so they set him a place by himself and by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them uh, themselves, because Egyptians could not eat food with Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. So now they're at two tables, and Joseph is not even eating with them. But he's feeding them. You, you, you're seeing that there is, there is distance, but there's a coming together. There is care, but something is happening. I want to say something to you that I think that many of you know this, but the restoration of Joseph and his brothers was a process. Restoration is more a process than it's an event. I know that we love events in America, but in the kingdom, it's more of a process. Joseph didn't make something that was private public. He never told the Egyptians what his brothers did to him. He learned by oversharing before. <laughs> uh, if you have ever overshared, <laughs> put that on pause here. Okay. Joseph provided for and protected his brothers, which proved he had really and deeply forgiven them. Listen, anything, anything that is real is going to be tested. Joseph didn't wait until they said they were sorry. He forgave them. If you wait until someone says they're sorry, you may wait forever because they may never be sorry. Don't wait until you get an I'm sorry to forgive. Just forgive so you can be free and move on with your life in Christ. Amen. There are people who hurt you. Forgiving them doesn't mean it was right. Doesn't mean it was okay. Doesn't mean it was good. Doesn't mean it was God approved. Doesn't mean it was God designed. It just means you're going to choose to be Christ-like to honor Him so that you can walk in freedom. Now, I, I really cannot preach this whole thing, so this is going to get dragged. This is going to get dragged out more and more. But th this is th this is something that you have to really resolve this in your spirit. That we are people of forgiveness. We are people of mercy. That's who we are. You know that's what makes us powerful. Restoration requires repentance. There is no real restoration without repentance. Now here's how this works. I can forgive you, right? But that doesn't mean we're restored. There, I'm going to say this. I hate to say that. I wish this wasn't true. Sometimes there will not be restoration. And you have to be okay with that. 
you got to contend for it, fight for it, believe for it. But there's times where you, you, you will just have to forgive someone, whether they acknowledge it, accept it, ask for it or not, and move on with your life. Because the inner conflict in them cannot keep you from the palace. Their confusion cannot keep Joseph from ruling. It could keep them all over the place, but don't let it keep you. They were stuck for 20 years. Their dad was stuck for 20 years. Joseph wasn't stuck. <laughs> you, you, you cannot, listen, you cannot let stuff hold you. Bless them, forgive them, and move on. God has a purpose for your life that unforgiveness will steal if you let it. All right, a couple more verses and we're done because this is way too, this is insane. Okay, and they sat before him in the firstborn. Now, now what he does is, he, you know what he does to them? He is giving them hints. He's messing with them, which I really enjoy. Not hurting them, messing with them. He sits them down in age order. From the oldest to the youngest. And you know what he's saying to them? I know you and I can see you. You don't know me and you can't see me because you're living in a state of confusion and I done trade I had a, I had a makeover. <laughs> you know, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he sits them down. And now now you gotta you gotta you gotta check this out. They're probably sitting there looking like, oh snap, <laughs> what's this? Like, like, you know, like. I'd be like, yo, is he going to execute us from the oldest to the youngest? That's what I'd be like, yo, they're going to shoot me and put this on YouTube. Like, this is crazy. You know, this is wild because they're all, I mean, this is, and they're just sitting there like, whoa. And, and you know, Joseph's across the other table like, just put yourself in Joseph's shoes. He knows what God is doing. He knows what he's doing. They don't know. Every time I say this, I'm trying to contrast something for you and I'm doing it on purpose because I want you to, I want to show you, I want to illustrate to you when someone does not have resolution in their life, when someone has confusion, it's very hard for them to understand what is happening in their own life. Right? And so if we're Christians and we're supposed to be ministers of Christ, we're supposed to be a blessing to people. If I do not even know what the heck is going on with me, How in the world can I really help someone when they call me and they don't know what the heck is going on with them? That, that's why the priority of God is God says, okay, deal with the log in your eye so that you can help your brother with his speck. So the priority of God in my life and in your life is us to deal with what is impairing our vision. And that little parable was self-righteousness, but whatever it is, it could be unforgiveness that is impairing our vision. It could be bitterness. It could be uh, self-hatred, resentment, whatever it is, but have the courage to allow God to work on the inside of you because we're, we're looking, we want, it, we want things to change on the outside, but if things on the inside don't change, things on the outside will never change. Okay. And they sat before him, firstborn according to his birthright, to the youngest according to his, and the men looked astonished at one another. <laughs> and then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving <laughs> was five times as much as theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. Let me, let me say one thing to you. I know you guys, I know it's late. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not really sorry. But it's late. But you know something? This is the goodness of God. He sits them in age order and goes... Half brother, 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 
five times. You know what? That was an opportunity for them to repent and confess what they did. Do you know many times God will give us opportunities and we miss it? Look at God. God, God. You know that they never really repented? Like they never were really like, like they live with guilt and they live with shame and they knew that those choices had consequences, but there was never a real heartfelt, like I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And you have to get to a point in your life where you may never get that, but you have resolution because you release forgiveness. And at that point, once you release forgiveness, it's not your problem. Recently, I showed, I showed some of these guys, <laughs> I showed some of these guys a, a, a screenshot of something nasty, uh, crazy that someone wrote to me. I forgave them, I don't care. I told them, that's your opinion, not mine. It, it's not meaningful to me. You, you, you just have to sometimes just release people. And, and that's it. No strings attached. The work that God is doing on the inside of you will be tested. But you know what's beautiful about that? I want to make sure that you hear that correctly. That's not a threat. That's a promise. Like if you buy something, don't you want to know it's real? You want to buy a fake iPhone? That overheats and lights your house on fire? You want to buy a fake watch so when you go and trade it in to get a better one? They go, pal, I got to tell you, you may have paid 10 Gs, but this is worth 300. You want, you're into fake stuff? I don't think so. That's the beauty of this. God tests it to make it real. That's not a threat. That's a promise. That's good news. Amen. God always tests what he builds in the kingdom to be powerful is to be merciful. To partner with God, you need divine perspective, which next week we're going to talk about divine perspective. I wanted to get there this week. It's just, it's just not possible. But, but the divine perspective is that Joseph was able to know what God was doing. And the beauty of that is when you're able to know what God is like and what God is doing, look, look at what he did. He's partnering with God. God said that those people are going into Egypt for 400 years, which means they cannot starve to death. Which means Egypt cannot starve to death. Which means God is going to send a man before them to preserve life. And he did it through people that were trying to take life. God works out all things after the counsel of his own will. God is bigger than your will. And God is bigger than my will, and God is bigger, and God is stronger, and God is wiser, and God is smarter, and God knows the end from the beginning, and God will use things that he did not do, things that are not a reflection of him, to produce his reflection in you. The Bible says one thing about the Father. This is something that I, if I read it alone, I will just melt. I'll just break. Especially if I read it in a real Bible, not on an iPad. The Father is merciful. Listen, if you have ever needed mercy and received mercy, <laughs> the Father is merciful and He's kind even to the unthankful. To those who don't even realize it, look at Look at how Joseph treated people who did not repent. Your love for people and your generosity toward people is not dependent on their response. If it is, they're controlling you. You in the kingdom of God are bigger than that. Don't ever let someone control your response. Don't ever give your power to someone else. 
That's yours. You have self-control. You have self-restraint. Don't do that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the eternal gospel that is true, that was true in the book of Genesis, that's true in the book of Revelation, that's true today, Lord, that you're a merciful God. And I pray, Lord, that you would produce merciful people who reflect the Father to an orphan planet so that we can be ministers of reconciliation. And I'm asking you, Lord, now to work restoration in the lives of your people. The Lord wants to restore health, family, finances, relationships, and there's another one, dreams. The Lord just brought something to my attention. There's a scripture in Psalms that said, when the captivity of Zion was released, we were like those who dream again. There's a God dream that's inside of you that God wants to speak to. It fell asleep. It didn't die. And God wants to wake it up. So Lord, I'm asking you for the restoration of dreams and visions, your purposes and your plans in the life of your people. In Jesus' name.